Really quick, if you don't know about Hello Wallet, easiest thing, fastest way for me to talk about this. Anybody know Mint.com? Right? Okay. So Mint.com is a PFM. Basic PFM tools, budgeting, goal setting. We took Mint.com and what about 150 other companies are doing with that basic PFM functionality and added financial guidance on top of that. And then we figured out a model in order to monetize that with enterprises or companies and sell it to their employees as a financial wellness benefit. Okay, where Mint.com gives it to you for free. If you don't know, they take your data, sell it to banks, and then push credit cards and bank products to you as a result of that. We figured out a way to be unbiased um, and independent, and that's why corporations buy Hello Wallet for their employees right now. Okay, but it, it, it wasn't always like that. So to start out talking about from the finance side of how we got going, um, our, our CEO and founder, Matt Fellows, he was formerly a, he used to be a professor here at uh, Georgetown for a short while after he got his doctorate, but he was a um, fellow at Brookings Institute. And he studied finance all across the country and wrote a lot of reports and saw a lot of different things happening. And he saw a gap that needed filled where over the past 60 years when credit cards had been issued back in the 50s and more access became available uh, for credit cards, checking accounts, savings, financial guidance stayed completely flat. So you have about 90% of the American population has access to checking accounts, credit cards, things like that, but only 18 to 20% have access to financial guidance. There's a lot of different reasons we can talk about, about why that is, but the bottom line is, is that he wanted to fill that gap for people, whether you are low income, high income, to be able to have access to affordable financial guidance. So he got the idea for Hello Wallet. Went to work, drew up a bunch of algorithms of how he could do this, essentially take a financial advisor that you go to and speak to in person, put it in front of you at a computer so you can access it from anywhere, not have to pay a guy and sit in front of him all day and figure out your finances. And Hello Wallet got started. So in the beginning, um, it, there was about eight of us. So he and our other founder started this, started bringing on a couple of us to get the business going. And I remember this, he said, you know, there was a meeting he had with some connections at Walmart. And I was like, whoa, we're talking to Walmart? Largest employer in the country, 1.4 million employees? Oh, really? He said, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna start talking to them. And at this point, there wasn't even a product. He had sketches, he had like his algorithm, he had ideas. Walmart flew in on their private jet, talked to them, they were amazed, had this, wow, you guys are awesome, this is fantastic, we're gonna be in touch soon. Nothing, just disappeared. We heard back from them every once in a while and it was this big joke in the office of, yeah, have you heard from Walmart? Yeah, yeah, who knows if they're even still around. Um, and, and it was like, okay, so what do we do now? Well, we actually went kind of a unique way for our initial investment round or our angel investors. So Rockefeller Foundation, we are the only company to get a grant. We got a $1 million grant from Rockefeller Foundation um, to start us off and build our initial product of Hello Wallet. We're the only for-profit company to do that with them. Uh, took a lot, a lot of back and forth. Um, because one of the main things that we do, in addition to being a for-profit company, we have a social mission. For every five licenses we sell, we give one license of Hello Wallet to a family in need to one of our nonprofit partnerships with Goodwill, um, Center uh, for American Progress, I'm sorry, uh, not Center for American Progress, um, Economic Progress, I'm sorry. So there's, there's a few other organizations that we work with on the nonprofit side to issue these. And so that's how we got partnered with Rockefeller you know, we were, we were eight people in those early stages. I remember when we, after um, we were looking at the, uh, the venture side of the business where we were gonna get our Series A, and uh, Matt Fellows, who's our CEO, came to me and said, Grant, I know you're about to give this webinar. It was our very first webinar. First one I ever had done for the company. I said, but I think there's a couple potential investors that are gonna be on this webinar, including Revolutions, which is Steve Case's, everybody knows Steve Case, founded AOL. Uh, his venture, uh, his VC. I said, well, no pressure. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> uh, 
So went into it, it went fine, and then um, two months later, we ended up getting our Series A from Revolutions. I think we had about 3.6 million in that round um, to really get us going. So it was a really exciting day. Every, th they're just huge milestones as you advance as a company. When you have, we've, um, and then uh, about a year and a half ago, we did our Series B uh, with Morningstar. If anyone has ever heard of Morningstar, big financial company based out of Chicago and a couple other VCs here in the DC area. But it, it's, it's been a really uh, exciting road so far. Um, when I came on, like I mentioned, we were eight employees. Now we have this new office in here in uh, near DuPont Circle that we moved to last April. We've got about 50 employees now and just continuing to hire on and on. The four things I wanna point out real quick about being an entrepreneur is first, figure out what you wanna do. Um, I, I, whenever I go to, to restaurants or hotels, I, I always see like how I would try to improve things. And, and if you have these types of things, like when you're out there in your everyday lives and you're like, oh, I, I bet if we tweak that a little bit or change that over there, I could run this better. Think, think about that, figure out what you wanna do first as an entrepreneur, because that could go a long way um, with how, you're, how your thinking is. Second thing, read. Just totally, I mean, it's hard to say when you're in school right now and that's all you do a lot, but there's, there's a lot of good things um, to read. Some things that really got me going. Lean Startup, if you've ever heard of that book. Um, Nudge, really great book about changing habits. Um, anything through health, wealth, and happiness. Um, <coughs> Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea, guy that started Zappos. Really great read. A lot of people put it in practice with their uh, end user support programs. And th th they're really good books um, to dive into if you have a little bit of time. Join and follow is my next thing. There's so many things to be a part of here in DC. DC tech meetups, um, 1776, great new accelerator that started last year. I just went to their uh, pitch night a couple weeks ago. If you haven't, I, I heard you guys do the one minute pitch. Wow, that is one of the hardest things in the world to do if you're starting your own company. These guys had one minute to go through, give their pitch before they could advance to the next round. And they said, you know, the past two days they've been working with mentors, pitch coaches, everything. And there were still plenty of people after all that help that just fell flat and didn't advance. I mean, you just have to know that cold of what you're trying to produce as far as your one minute pitch of your product. So join those guys. Um, Tech Cocktails, another great one. I uh, always love to go to their events. They mix a couple drinks with doing uh, showcasing of new tech startups, unique model. They do it all over the country. Um, have to promote behavior change, designing behavior change. Um, our chief data scientist recently wrote a book on changing behaviors through technology. And it's actually uh, being released later this month. And so he has a whole design behavior change uh, meetup that he does every couple months at our office to talk about that. So last thing, discover people with similar interests, all right? Look for that guy or girl that's twice as smart as you, especially when you're joining a company. You might think you're the smartest person in the room, but and I'm not an arrogant guy. I like to walk that line of confidence and arrogance sometimes, but the people I work with are 10 times smarter than me. I mean, I'm just every day in awe when I go into meetings with our CEO or CFO and their backgrounds and things that they have achieved. Um, and I learned so much from it. So trying to find that other person because you're not gonna be able to do this alone. To work with is a hard thing. Trust is a tough thing to come by um, in this industry when you wanna get, uh, get started. You know, when you read about Twitter, there was, there was a guy, one guy that people don't talk about much with Twitter that got completely pushed out uh, a couple years in and he's not seeing a dime of that, that money that Evan Williams and Jack Dorsey combined $4 billion today that they have from that IPO, he's not seeing a dime of that. So you, you gotta be careful who you trust with those. Um, so really think about what you wanna do with what you're passionate about. Um, read quite a bit, join something here uh, locally and then uh, really discover some really smart people that can surround you.
heard a lot about crowdfunding. What do we mean by crowdfunding? Well, like it sounds, right? Can you, can you make a mass appeal to a group of people who might have interest in your, in your idea? And crowdfunding doesn't only apply to startup businesses. Really, it applies to any kind of project where you want to uh, raise support from a, from a large group of people. Um, so documentary films use crowdfunding as a way of raising money. Um, campaigns raise you know, support and money through crowdfunding. But it does also work for startups. Essentially, what you're doing through crowdfunding um, is pre-selling your product, right? You're getting people to buy in advance based on a prototype or a description of what you're trying to produce, um, which, has, which has the benefit of not only bringing in money for you to make those prototypes, but also it gives you some proof of concept. Right? So if you can use a crowdfunding platform and people are interested in what you're describing, and we're going to talk about a couple of instances of students who've done this, but if people respond, then you know you may be onto something, right? Even before the product is ready, if that description is sufficiently captivating that people will want to buy it, well, that's great proof of concept. And that's a really important thing to establish early on. You won't be able to get any more sophisticated forms of investment until you can prove that there's a market out there for what you're trying to, to sell. So crowdfunding is very useful for that. And one of the challenges with crowdfunding, or at least historically one of the challenges with it, is that uh, to raise equity from, uh, from a not people you don't necessarily know, those people have to be accredited or qualified investors. Um, so that, I don't know if that's a familiar term, but essentially what we're saying is they have to be sophisticated investors, which typically means essentially a high net worth individual. Right? And that, that may change. You've probably heard a lot about the Jobs Act. Um, that hopefully will change and will allow, um, essentially lower the bar of how we define a high net worth investor, people who can put equity into startups. But right now, that change hasn't come into effect. So it's still a, a relatively difficult way to raise equity funding for a <coughs> startup. Hopefully, that will change. When I talk about crowdfunding uh, with my students, I also uh, often talk about what I call customer funding. So for example, just a minute ago, I said, you know, you can sell your product through crowdfunding. Well, that's using a, uh, essentially a, a high-tech platform to, to sell your product. But you can also just sell, you can pre-sell your product to customers. One of the most interesting stories I heard recently of, uh, I guess, the startup funding uh, is actually was in Pittsburgh. It was a microbrewer in Pittsburgh who, uh, actually, this is, a, this is a great story. He was a chemical engineer, sort of 15 years, but he had a passion for, for microbrews, brewing. He decided one day he'd, he'd done chemical engineering for long enough. He was going to set up this microbrewery. Um, he, um, you know, pulled together his savings. He started, you know, I mean, li literally, like in a shed, um, you know, I don't know anything about brewing beer, so I won't go into much detail. But in any case, it really took off. And he was suddenly, very quickly, had reached the capacity of what he could do. He needed $100,000 to carry on taking his business to the next level. Didn't really want to borrow it. He, he put a note out to his customers. He offered, he, he basically said, you know, buy $1,000 worth of, of beer in advance. Um, I'll give you an IOU. He had so many people lining up to do this that he raised $100,000 in like a week. Now this is something you hear a lot about in the world of startups and it can be a great thing. Angel investors are essentially uh, individuals, oftentimes they are um, entrepreneurs themselves, uh, who understand what startups are about, who want to invest, especially in these very early stage businesses. They tend to be very forward looking people. They're, they're looking to be ahead of the curve. They want to find that next great idea before everybody else hears about it. So they're really disposed to looking at startups and they're, and they're a good source of funding. Um, typically, they will invest in a whole series of startups. That's how they mitigate their own risk because they know that, you know, whatever, one in 10 of the, of the startups they invest in are really gonna succeed. So they invest in a whole series of startups. They'll probably be very um, uh, involved, I should say, very engaged in, in, your, in your venture. Um, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. My advice there is um, think, about, think about what that investor might be able to offer in addition to money, right? They're essentially, essentially gonna be a partner with you. So do they have expertise? Do they have, do they have contacts, um, operational knowledge that could be useful to you? Do they have something other than the money that they can offer? If they do, it's probably a very good fit.
So some of the examples that we have for you are uh, with startups with and the type different types of financing. Now, not every startup you know has the same just one type. So, you know, sometimes they have different types. And so, um, a company that bootstrapped was College Prowler, and they sell college guides for students. Um, that are written by students for students, and so this was uh, this was a student that I worked with uh, a few years ago. And when they first started out, this is the way College Prowler came to you. Anybody heard of College Prowler? Oh, okay, a couple of you. And now it's electronic. And so one of the things that they do is they started selling books, and he was bootstrapping this. And finally, after quite a few years of putting this, you know, putting this you know product out in paper, and decided that they wanted to go to electronic. Actually, the internet became pretty, a pretty strong force, and that's what he was doing, was putting it on the internet. And people didn't like paying for information on the internet, so he had to find a different revenue model, and he did. He also had some angel fund funding, so people came along and gave him some money so that he could make that transition from paper text, you know, which is what this was, you know, which was what published here, and moving on to the electronic format. Um, Friends and family have uh, done some work too. This is a uh, uh, this is a startup called Mod Cloth. Some of you may have heard of Mod Cloth. They do vintage clothing, and uh, this is Susan. Uh, she uh, she and her husband. I, I worked. Her husband was one of my students, and I didn't work with Susan, but I, I you know I know her, and they had developed a, um, a website selling one of a kind vintage clothing when they were. Uh, when they were undergraduates, and then Eric, her husband, went on for his MBA, was one of my students, and they developed a, a process where they're looking at um, you know, selling clothes, no longer one-of-a-kind items, but items that were, um, you know, even, even, even uh, items that um, were vintage, but also they were looking at some new designs, and so one of the things they do is have, they have, um, a, you know, do they make the cut? I, I may have that wrong, but they're looking at people who are putting out drawings of, of clothes, and you can decide which one gets you know gets to be actually executed, and so that that takes place. So uh, they've done very well. They were um, seen as one of the up and coming. They've been mentioned. Uh, this is uh, the they made the cover of Entrepreneurship uh, Magazine. So they're uh, one of the. Also, I think in Forbes they were one of the. Uh, you know, youngest 30, 30 under, th uh, 30 p entrepreneurs under 30. This is a, uh, you know, we're talking about crowdfunding, and this is uh, a Georgetown student, and she was she was looking to sell one of her ideas is to tell watches uh, f with that that are braille that the blind can read, and she to do that she said she needed to start selling watches, and so. She's selling watches. It's called Touch Dome, and that's why it's called Touch Dome, is so you can touch it and read the Braille if you have low vision or no vision. And she was looking to find funding, and what she did is she, she pre-sold them. You know, Alyssa told you about pre-selling beer. Well, you know, Kathleen was pre-selling watches, and that's how she got the crowdfunding to get her business up and started and running. And so... Um, we'll see how that proceeds. I think she's going to be successful in moving this forward. We'll see what other kind of funding she comes along with. Um, Angel Investors, this is a company called Metro Naps. They came to class, and I thought, this has to be the absolute craziest idea. They wanted to sell naps. And I said, you want to do what? And he says, we want to sell naps. And I said, really? And so they did a test. They had a proof of concept that you can take a nap. I mean, you know, you can take a nap, anybody. So they wanted to sell naps in New York City, and so they decided that that's what they were going to do, and they were in the class, and I had uh, an angel investor come in uh, as, as students are preparing their, their pitches. It's one of the things that they do in, in some of my classes, and I had an angel come in, and he pitched, he made some suggestions, and then he said, well, I'll invest. And so I was like, Wow. So it sort of surprised me. I thought no one will ever invest in here. Somebody invested right in the class. And they started, they went to the Empire State Building, and they, they took a nap. And <laughs> it's very comfortable. And some people have a Rip Van, you know, a rip van uh, wrinkle uh, 
effect. You know, I, they left me in there overnight. I grew a beard. No, just kidding. No. So they actually quit the nap business. And they were doing this in New York City because they had people would get up for finance for the Tokyo Bell and then the London Bell and then the New York Bell. And, you know, and then by noon, they were, they, were, they were gone. So they needed to take a nap. That's what they do. So Christopher and Ashad, th what they did was they got out of that business and what they're doing now is selling the pods. And that's what their business is. And so they've you know, started from an angel, a, a angel funding, and they've been successful. They have offices now in New York, Copenhagen, and Vancouver. And so I uh, hope they continue with their success. Another angel uh, that this, this one is um, another Georgetown student. He took a class of mine last year and he's developing electric bicycles. And so he's looking to put the new millennials into their first electric vehicle. And he goes on with his pitch. There are 55 miles of bicycle trails and, and, and on the roads here around the DC area. So he's looking for people to put their first vehicle <coughs> maybe in their hallway of their apartment or condo. And so he's looking at rides and building that, looking at his first angel funding coming in um, soon, right? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe this week. 